so uh, I, I have a commitment with myself. When we started here, I said the one thing I'm not going to do is tell stories about my home and family life and kids every week because it's sort of, that's one of the things that consumes my life. I have four small children and so I think a lot about them and I really could come up with an illustration of every point that I could ever think of in the microcosm of sociology and psychology that is raising four small children. But some of you don't have kids and you're like, I, the, the worst thing when you don't have kids is to listen to the people with kids and their stories about their kids. You know that friend who just had a baby and wants to talk about how cute the baby is and how the baby did this cute thing where he was breathing and and uh, had, oh, and then, then the baby woke up, and then the baby had food, and you're kind of like, okay, I don't want to talk about the baby. Uh, but I'm going to make an exception this week because I was, I was looking at the parable that I wanted to talk about. And the thing that Jesus teaches us, not only about fairness, but about uh, what we are each given and what we are each gifted with, and really uh, how he holds us responsible for that. And I was thinking about that in relationship to small children. When you raise small children, you develop very quickly a theology, I would say, of fairness. You have to come up with some doctrine of fairness because they have a doctrine of fairness. And you have to decide if your two theologies match. Um, so uh, you, you immediately, by the time they learn to talk, they learn to know that some things they don't like and some things they think are not fair. Uh, it's a, a really great example. Uh, I'll give you a bunch of examples. You know, when uh, we send the kids to bed, uh, they will say, oh, no fair, uh, which is kind of funny because we send them to bed every night. It's not like we've picked tonight to punish you in some way by sending you to bed. Um, she has a stuffed monkey, but I don't. I want to have a stuffed monkey. Even though I have 4,000 other stuffed animals, I don't have that particular stuffed monkey, and therefore this is not fair. This, I, I brought these, um, my wife brought them to me tonight, because the people at Ikea have uh, bedeviled me with these things right here. So we thought, well, those are great, those Ikea cups, right? Look at that. That is the perfect toddler to, you know, uh, grade school age child cup. It's about six ounces or so. You can put milk and juice and all kinds of stuff in it. They're plastic, they're easy to... The one thing we did not think through and were not aware of was that children care very deeply for some reason about what color of cup they get. Now, if, if these dudes had offered to sell us um, a, a sleeve of these cups that were all the same color, they would have saved me a lot of trouble because for the first few years, the twins were always fighting over who had the pink cup. I want the pink cup, she has the pink cup, it's not fair, she always gets the pink cup, I want the pink cup. And then we convinced one of them that they liked the blue cup. So <laughs> then we had the pink cup and the blue cup and everybody understood, okay, this is, this is my cup, right? And then, uh, but then they, and then Maya came along and we convinced Maya that she liked orange. And so we were all set, pink and blue and orange. And then, uh, actually, no, this is wrong. It was, uh, it was pink and yellow, right? Uh, Kareen, we convinced her that maybe she likes some yellow sometimes. I've lost my illustrations. And then, uh, then another child comes along. And then what happens is they shift and they change their mind. And all of a sudden now the kid who could not live without the pink cup cannot live without the yellow cup. And it's unfair that they got the yellow cup. And so we have had nonstop screaming and whining and crying because somebody got the wrong cup. What's that? Don't lose that pink cup. Do not lose it. I, the pink cup is right there. We cannot lose the pink cup. Fairness. Um, there is a scenario. This is a, a great example of a scenario where it's not possible to be fair all the time. If you like Star Trek, this is the Kobayashi Maru of breakfast time. There is... There is, thank you, thank you. Uh, there is, this is a no-win scenario. You cannot possibly make everybody happy. Um, confession time. I do not always treat my children fairly. <clears throat> In fact, sometimes I am rampantly, terribly unfair. Sometimes I spend a little more time with one of them than the other one. Sometimes I spend a lot more time. Sometimes I might take one of them somewhere and leave the others. Um, those are good times. Uh, the, the, 
not, not because I'm tired of them. Uh, right now, I, uh, I play Tickle Monster with the younger ones, which involves, you know, basically me chasing them around the house and, and uh, you know, there's tickling and stuff. Um, I can't do that with the older ones because I get hurt. And so, and also it's weird, and they're in seventh grade, or second grade now, and so they're seven years old. Uh, and so uh, now it's unfair because I'm doing the same thing with them at their age that I used to do with them at their age, but they're older, but they can't do it. And the younger ones are upset because it's not fair that they can't, you know, go on the same roller coaster as their, you know, older sister. And we... Um, we have these fairness issues because they're different. They're different kids. And at different times, they have different needs, and they need different things, and they have different requirements, and so they get treated differently. And they're not terribly happy about that, but that's just how it is. Uh, uh, another confession, our parenting style tends to flow naturally out of our personality. So the way that we deal with things being unfair uh, involves uh, a combination of sarcasm and friendly mocking, um, which I, it may be bad, and you might want to take me aside and teach me how to raise children better later, but the, the, it gets to a point where you're like, okay, I know that you want everything to be perfectly equal, but that's not the same thing as, as being fair or just. So um, one of the ways that we diffuse that is, you know,
family background. Some of us may come from a poor family background. Some of us may have had good education. You may have fallen into a really great job that gives you good opportunities. You may have worked really hard and, and you know, made it a certain way in your life. Um, you may have been born with just great gifts and talents and uh, maybe you can sing like Isaac or play guitar badly like me or whatever it happens to be. Uh, if you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but we all have something, right? We've all been given something. And a lot of times we say that our life is limited by what we have or what we've been given or, or what we were born with or what we grew up with or, um, or where we're at today. I would like to do more, but... I can't because I'm, I'm limited. And if you think this is just an isolated story where Jesus is a one-off thing, maybe the disciples misheard it, it, it seems to be a pretty common theme in a lot of the things he says. If you look in Luke 12, he says, the servant who knows his master's will does not get ready, does not do what the master wants, will be beaten with many blows. Not cool. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows from for, excuse me, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. John 21, Jesus is talking to Peter. And uh, this is after Jesus has risen from the dead and there, you know, Jesus has just given them this great uh, bunch of fish. Uh, they caught a bunch of fish and it was a big miraculous thing. And Jesus cooks breakfast for the disciples and they're sitting around talking about how things will be after, after Jesus has left them. And Jesus says to Peter, truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself, you went where you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you, lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. And Peter, in a uh, pattern that's really typical for the disciples, um, brings up somebody else. This is the disciples are always asking Jesus, who's the greatest? Who's going to sit on your left and right? Uh, who's going to be in charge? You know, uh, who, who's the best amongst us is one of their common arguments. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, was following them. When Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? You just told me that I'm going to be bound and crucified and I'm going to, this is the death that I'm going to die for you. But what about this guy over here that you love? Jesus' answer is just fascinating. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. So Peter says, is this going to be fair? What about him? Jesus says, what does it matter? What do you care whether it's going to be fair or not? Just follow me. Listen to what I'm asking of you, not what I've asked of anybody else, not what I've given to anybody else. And, and you know, John editorializes after that and says, well, this isn't really that Jesus meant that I, I'm going to live forever. Mark chapter 12, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowds put money in the temple treasury. Many people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more in the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So there's this theme that we have a responsibility for what we have been given, beyond what we think is equitable or fair, beyond looking at somebody else and saying, well, this is what they've been given, and if I only had that, things would be better for me. Jesus is saying, no, I will not hold you responsible for what someone else does when you compare yourself to them, but I hold you responsible for what you have in your hands and what you're doing with it. That's the main point. So let's ask a couple of questions. Let's turn this thing on and maybe it'll work better. Awesome. Which of these three servants, now these are, we're going to do table talk, we'll talk to each other. You can skip to another table if you don't like the people you're sitting next to, whatever you want to do. Um, it'll be obvious and hurtful for them, but that's all right. Um, which of these three servants do you most identify with? The one who has, who ends up with 10? The one who ends up with, I, I put five, but uh, my math was totally wrong. Should say the one who ends up with 10, the one who ends up with four, and the one who ends up with one, or the one who was given five, the one who was given two, and the one who was given one. Okay, uh, which of those people do you feel like? Do you feel like, well, I'm just, you know, old one, 
one bag of gold McGee over there, or I'm you know, the guy who has all of these wonderful gifts and I, and I feel a little bad about it sometimes because I, I have so many opportunities. Where do you land on that spectrum? Talk to each other about that. What types of things in your life could be counted as your bag of gold? I mentioned a few. I mentioned, you know, abilities, um, opportunities, maybe financial uh, provision that you have, or it, it, it may be something entirely different that we haven't thought of yet. And here's a really great question. Have you ever known anyone who wasted their opportunities? And beyond that, have you ever known anyone who succeeded despite serious advantages? What makes the difference between those two types of people? So there's a bunch of things you can talk about. And then in about 10 minutes or so, I'm going to come back with one more thought, and then we're going to have some communion and worship together. Let me just take maybe 90 seconds and say, give you one more thing. My idea when I say one more thing is I, I, I want this to be something that maybe you think about and talk about or, or you know, rolls around in your brain. Um, it's not about fairness. Jesus isn't talking about fairness. I'm going to give you all the same outcomes, but it's about faithfulness. And the question isn't really what do you have or what situation are you in, but the question is what are you going to do about it? And all throughout the Bible, there's this very cool theme where God uh, talks to people and uses what they have. A uh, good example is Moses. Moses is saying, I can't do it. I can't talk. I have a speech impediment. I can't tell Pharaoh all these things. God says, Moses, I'll send your brother Aaron along with you so he can do the talking. And then he asks him what's in his hand. It's a staff. Okay, let's use the stick that's in your hand. When Jesus is doing miracles, he'll sometimes use the things that are around. He'll use mud and spit and ask if anybody has some, some lunch when he wants to, you know, multiply and <laughs> feed thousands of people. Um, those two being separate stories. Um, Jesus tends to focus on, on what we have. And the, the real question is not um, what does someone else have or what do you not have? But it, I like to think of it this way. If the accounts are being settled, if that guy who went a, a long way away is coming back, and that's Jesus, and I'm standing before Jesus and I'm talking to him about my life and the things that I've done and the things that were given to me, be they small or be they large, and what I have done with them throughout my life, the opportunities that I have to uh, share hope and grace with other people, kindness and and money and time and energy and all that stuff. Am I going to be really happy with the account that I have to give? Or are, is it possible that I could still stand to give up a little more and do with a little less and help somebody else out more and spend some of my time on this? Is, it, is there room in my life to maximize investing in the right things? I don't know if that's where you are, it's definitely where I am, is the question that God is just pounding into my heart these days to say, you know, what are you doing with the opportunities you have? I was walking uh, to work one day and there was graffiti on a wall uh, right next to me and that's not unusual where I walk to work. Um, there's this one really cool spot I walk by every day, I call it Urine Alley, it's really cool. Um, uh, but there was this giant like store that was all boarded up and someone had come along and graffitied it which is normally like things you can't read or understand but this particular graffiti you could understand and it just simply said in really bad English how will you make today for counting <laughs> which is not a great sentence but it's a phenomenal question. So let me just ask it to you this way. How will you make this week for counting? 